The global economy is currently undergoing the greatest change since the Industrial Revolution. In order to remain internationally competitive, modern factories must be as flexible as possible and highly digitized. The smart networking of people, machines and industrial processes is the ticket to a new age. Industry 4.0 Reutlingen in Baden-Württemberg has one of the most modern semiconductor factories in Germany. With meticulous care and highly automated, the soccer field-sized clean room produces around 1 billion micro-mechanical sensors per year, which are used in cars and smartphones. The structures in the nanometer range are applied to silicon wafers. Silicon is a semiconductor, but what is it good for? Semiconductors, we actually have three terms here in the group. The senses of a device, the brain of a device and the muscles. We are currently the global leader. We've produced over 10 billion of these micromechanical sensors to date, both for automotive and consumer electronics. In the so-called wafer fab, the future is being built. In the field of electric driving, autonomous driving, networking, but also in the consumer sector, we are continuously developing sensor technology. In the sterile, futuristic tech world of the plant in Reutlingen, as the internal code of the facility goes, it feels more like being in a space station than in a factory. Every square centimetre of the 23,400 square metre area is designed across several floors, a tremendous effort to enable precision in the tiniest of spaces. We model very small structures. The smallest are about a thousand times smaller than a human hair. What is being built here in Reutlingen is found in countless products spread all over the world. In vehicles, mobile phones, in just about everything that requires electronic control. Klaus Meder is chairman of the Automotive and Electronics Division. In Reutlingen, we manufacture semiconductors and sensors mainly for the automotive industry, but also for the consumer sector and control units. Approximately half of all modern smartphones that you can buy on the market today contain sensors from the Reutlingen site, such as sensors that measure rotation rate, acceleration or pressure differences, and in every fitness tracker that we are likely to have today. The group, which is best known to most people for domestic engineering, is also active in less visible areas of modern life. However, this would not be possible without a widely used chemical substance. The technical plant manager, Patrick Leinenbach, is responsible for semiconductor manufacturing at Bosch. The base material for our manufacturing processes is silicon. Silicon is a so-called semiconductor. It has both insulating and conductive properties. You can actually think of it as sand. Besides impurities, sand consists mainly of silicon, However, only pure silicon is used for chip production. And then this silicon is extracted from so-called ingots, such rods. This rod is made of high-purity, high-density silicon material. It weighs about 10 kilos. From that, our silicon wafers are cut. We don't produce all this here, but we buy these so-called wafers, which are made of sand. Experts refer to one type of chip produced here as MEMS, Microelectromechanical Sensors. Jens Fabrowski is the divisional director responsible for semiconductors. Semiconductors are the little black bugs we know from electronics, and they are really very small. Our smallest ones have an edge length of one millimeter. The bigger ones are as big as a thumbnail, and that's where we put our circuits. There's silicon in there, all the intelligence is in there, miniaturized and wrapped in plastic with small contacts.
The semiconductor scale is the measure of how many functions I can fit into a single component. The smaller the semiconductor scale is, the narrower the tracks and the layers are, the more functions I can pack into one component of the same square millimeter size. To get this intelligence into the tiny parts, around 3,500 employees work in Reutlingen in three shifts. The real writing work on the silicon wafers is done by machines. Here, more than 15,000 of them. The wafer fab is a single highly automated machine that produces over 4 million individual parts a day. In order to maintain an overview here, computer-aided production control is required. Stephanie Hessel is responsible for this. Her team ensures that no errors occur during the thousands of strictly regulated parallel processes. The production control is responsible for ensuring that the wafers move ideally through the production process. A wafer is a silicon plate which is processed by us and which runs through up to 1,000 process steps in succession. The movement of the wafer is partly ensured by automation. This means that robot transport systems move the wafers through production. The purpose of automation here is that each wafer must know where it's moving to next. What the next process step is that it will go through. That's where software, a planning system, supports us because it's such a complex situation. We have up to 70,000 wafers in stock which move around here for up to three months and see the same equipment and process steps over and over again. But why is it necessary for the highly sensitive wafers to go through the same processing steps over and over again for months? Bekir Zermatsic, who heads an engineering department, can answer this question best. You can compare this very well to designing and building a house. You build the house on one level, create different rooms and then go up to the first floor, to the second floor, then to the third floor. With the chip it's very similar. On one level, you realize different building elements. And in order to make the most out of the chip space that you have on the wafer, you have to move up. This means that the different other levels then happen on the different other floors. The process sequences are repeated in the same way as in house building. There are crafts that do plastering or install cables. This takes place in every room. And that's what we do on the wafer surface in the same way from level to level in recurring cycles. To be able to produce houses on a micro scale, Bosch employees in the wafer fab, the clean room of the highest category, have to follow a strict procedure every time. No one enters the facility in normal clothing. Washing hands and walking over several adhesive mats on the floor is mandatory to get into the changing room in the first place. And that's where the actual clean room clothing is waiting. Putting on the clothes follows a strict procedure, from top to bottom. No body hair and only the area of skin around the eyes may remain free. All employees have their own suit. I'm going into the wafer fab right now, and to do so, I have to cover up completely every time. Firstly with the hood, and then also with the overall. This is a special material that is suitable for clean room use, which emits very few particles and therefore helps us to maintain cleanliness in the clean room. The final preparations, then a strange machine world waits behind the overpressure airlock which permanently blows air, and therefore possible particles, out of the clean room. In the wafer fab, nothing is left to chance. Every installation, every section and every step is precisely planned. In 2010, the group inaugurated its Reutlingen factory for the 200mm wide wafers. This is where the MEMS often months-long construction process begins. We 
The raw wafers are ordered here. They come up in this paternoster and are then launched into the system so that the commerce knows exactly which material is coming. This is then booked so that I can put them on the labeler. This is on station E2. First, each wafer receives an ID. Before the wafers become chips, they first get a chip. This chip helps us to know where each box is at any moment and which step is planned next. This is an RFID chip that is written virtually and not manually. That means we use it several times. As soon as the box is delivered, the memory is erased and set to zero. As soon as a new batch is launched, like here, it is rewritten with the new batch number. The number of the wafer on the RFID chip remains the same as long as the wafer is here in production. That means it can take from 14 days up to three months. Production time for such a sensor or chip can almost be compared to building a house. There are big differences there too. Am I making a prefabricated house or building brick on brick? In our production we have different production times depending on the design and on the chip. We're talking about processing times from a few weeks to two or three months. Here we can see on a chart what we do all the day in production control. We see what the utilization is, here for example in automation. This way we can see where we have to intervene to avoid congestion. This chart shows the utilization in automation over the last 24 hours online from yesterday up until this very moment. Such a high-tech clean room cannot be run in just any old factory. Semiconductor manufacturing has special requirements. Not only the immediate clean room environment, but also the building around it must have very specific features. The silicon wafers and their fragile structures are so extremely sensitive that all employees who are in the same building must follow a special routine. Facility manager Karl Schull knows what needs to be considered in the wafer fab. We have regulations concerning entrance to the building. We're not allowed to enter the building in our regular shoes. Just like the production levels, we also have a range of purity classes. Down here, we come in wearing regular shoes. Then we change into indoor shoes, which I'm wearing now. Then we go one level up, we change from our regular clothes to jogging clothes, which I'm also wearing now, and then another level further up, we put on the clean room clothes and enter the clean room. The building has a very specific structure. Here we see a profile of the entire building with a total of four stories. The top story is where the ventilation system with the supply and exhaust air is accommodated. Then there's the floor where all the clean room technology and our production facilities are located. Below this floor is a clean room sublevel, and the lowest level is the supply level. Here the entire media supply and the vacuum pumps are located. And all this is done to create the ideal environment. An important part of the production is the so-called Bosch process. What exactly is that? It has revolutionized the manufacturing of micromechanical sensors. The key process for manufacturing is the so-called Bosch process, which was developed by us, by our research and advanced development department in the mid-90s, and was introduced into manufacturing at the end of the 90s. With this process, it's possible to produce certain structures in silicon, which then enable us to create sensory abilities. For example, measuring accelerations by juxtaposing two plates, by creating thin membranes that can map the corresponding pressures. All this is due to the Bosch process, which was developed by Franz Leimer and Andrea Schilb in the mid-90s. It then received the European Inventor of the Year award and later it was also awarded the Future Prize by the German Federal President as part of the holistic approach to micromechanics. The structures that are applied to the wafers are so delicate that even a storm outside can lead to production disruptions, or rather, it could. The 
In principle, the building has two parts, a building within a building. We have one large block, 48 meters wide and 100 meters long, and it's housed in an outer skin that's completely decoupled. That means that the production level sits on top of this. It has a foundation that's one meter thick and weighs over 10,000 tons. The roof that hangs above it, which can see up here, is unsupported. That means that all the ventilation technology and clean room technology is completely decoupled from the production machines. This ensures that all the vibrations that come into the building from outside are not transmitted to the production systems. This joint is visible throughout the entire building. We're now down on the supply level. This is the inner building, as I explained earlier. Down here is the joint that separates it from the rest of the building and runs through all levels. What we see here is the joint that separates the two buildings. If you look at it from the outside, you'd expect a gap of about five centimeters, which we filled with silicon. But we didn't, because that would also cause strong coupling again. Under here, there's only bast fiber, which has been sealed, so it's compatible for clean room use. Down here, this is just a cover. The construction is the same as on the wall. What we have here are two metal plates, which can move freely on top of each other in order to have decoupling here as well. Here we're walking past the gallery, where we can see the building's construction stages, and we can have a look at the different levels. Here you can see these circles, the tubes in the floor where the air flows through later. The clean room ceiling is supported by the columns, which is then the airflow level. The air flows back up into the clean room. It's very loud here, so I have to speak up. In the background we can hear the vacuum pumps from level one, which create the vacuum for the production systems. The sophisticated building technology, elaborate in every detail, reflects the precision required for manufacturing semiconductor products. The basic condition for working reliably in the wafer fab is the highly specialized environment. Thomas Richter is responsible for the wafer front end in Reutlingen and knows exactly what challenges the employees from production planning have to overcome. Everything that the systems build is first digitally simulated. Our manufacturing processes are relatively complex, so the software is used in a particular way. We always have to know where our material is, which processing step it's in, what the next step is to avoid duplication, and we always have to pick up the right material in the right order. This can no longer be done on the production control handout. This requires intelligent software that maps out everything that happens in the real world to a digital twin in a parallel world. Intelligent algorithms are then determined from this, which material comes next and what is the next production step. Each individual wafer contains up to several thousand chips. We are talking about a complexity of up to 70,000 wafers that are in production here. These 70,000 wafers are moved 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In order to manage this complexity, you need the tools to do so, because as an ordinary human being, you can simply no longer understand it. To cope with this complexity, it's best to leave each individual logistical decision to the computer. Therefore, a large part of the production in the RTP-1 is fully automated. This robot choreography is directed by IT engineer and automation expert Peter Buzek and his team. In fact, we as humans usually don't know where the robot will go next. That's also the special thing about automation as we've designed it here. In fact, all decisions about a robot's next destination, i.e. which batch it should take to which plant, are determined in real time. In Echtzeit ermittelt werden. To ensure that everything runs smoothly, the production control is always close to the action, but only intervenes when necessary. We use the digital twin to form the condition of the material on the line, which production step is pending, 
what is the current state of the system, which order is the most urgent at the moment. We map all this digitally in software and control our production flow via the software. The software tells the machine which material to take and which steps to produce. To develop maximum efficiency, two core areas in particular are automated. On the one hand, automation as we see it in this area here includes the unloading and loading of our wafers from the production lines. On the other hand, it also includes transporting the batches from one station to another. In this machine choreography, each protagonist has a distinct role. Specialization increases the output. The production area in our clean room is very expensive. Therefore, we're interested in using this production area as efficiently as possible. In addition, we can realize fantastic solutions through automation, such as this robot booth we can see here. The robot, which is installed in here as a stationary unit, can move batches in a very confined space quickly and precisely from one system to another. A human being is not suitable for this task. We can't touch the wafer because we work under clean room conditions. To give you some idea, clean room means it's like looking for a cherry stone in Lake Constance. That's how pure the air in the clean room is. Of course, the human touch, even if they wear gloves, would be rather counterproductive on the wafer. We would apply dirt and structures and destroy the parts. We are here in photolithography, which is basically the heart of our production. Photolithography is an optical imaging process which happens with photosensitive materials. That's why we use yellow light to avoid incorrect exposure. There's the example of building a house when realizing our product. Photolithography provides the building plan for each floor that we build in the house. For each of our products that we manufacture, there's a building plan for each level, up to 36 levels per product. As the heart of the plant, we're in operation 24 hours a day and have the highest output here. Each product passes through this processing station up to 36 times and the efficiency of our machines is highest when we operate them automatically. You have to imagine a machine in which the wafer is placed. Different chemical layers are applied there which are differently illuminated by photolithography and then etched off. That means you always have a physical and chemical interaction in the machine. During the process you want to find out whether it will be a good part or a bad part. That means you record all possible machine parameters. Humans are there to fix malfunctions. If everything runs smoothly, we watch what happens. If we have a malfunction somewhere, we're there quickly and can eliminate the error or the shortage with our know-how. The wafers we process in production are not touched by people. We use automatic equipment for this. This is our level of automation. However, we also work in the Industry 4.0 world, and there we're just moving on to the subject of 5G. The robots all move autonomously, which means they are equipped with sensors and monitoring devices. These four generations take care of each other. They are all interconnected. They recognize each other, and like at a crossroads in traffic, two robots heading for the same destination coordinate their actions. One waits, and the other has right of way. The traffic between humans and robots, for example in the area we're currently in, is regulated quite simply. Humans always have priority. The reason we have four different generations of robots is that on the one hand we have stationary robots that work in specially constructed booths. These are small rooms where we can really make optimal use of the available space. 
and a stationary robot, which is capable of making really adventurous movements in a very small space and can move batches very quickly, is ideally suited to this purpose. However, there are three robots in Goitlingen that enjoy a very special status. We name the robots ourselves, of course. They are Eva, Paula and Robert, and there's quite a nice story behind it. The real purpose of naming the robots was to differentiate between them. It is, of course, much easier for us humans to deal with robots if they have human names. The very special thing here is that we named them after the children of Robert Bosch. This is a way for us to make sure that these robots belong to the Robert Bosch family. Robert Bosch, who founded his workshop for precision mechanics and electrical engineering in neighboring Stuttgart in 1886, would certainly be proud of his mechanical descendants. After this quality processing step, the goods move on to the next processing step, which can be diverse. That means I don't know the exact destination. Therefore, the goods are transported via the transport system behind me back to the main aisle and are distributed from there. And every time a batch travels onto a turntable, the decision is, does it go straight into the storage or does it turn off to the next production line? In these situations, decisions are made in real time. The system recalculates which priority is now the important one and which route the batch should take. While the routes of the individual batches are constantly being recalculated, the direction for further development in Reutlingen is already set. We are now at a point where we will revolutionize electromobility, where we use so-called silicon carbide, which enables us to produce products that in turn enable our customers to provide electromobility with a longer range, lower losses and lower energy requirements. Silicon carbide is the material for the chips of the future. The chemical symbol for it is SIC, or SIC, as it's known in the industry. In order to use the semiconductor as desired, so-called ions, positively charged atoms, must be implanted in the in-house particle accelerator. Ion implantation is one of the most important process steps we have in semiconductor manufacturing. It's very complex. The machines are amongst the most expensive, largest and heaviest machines available in the semiconductor world. This implanter is about the size of a car garage, weighs about 14 tonnes and is very expensive. The ions are generated at the very back of the machine in the ion source. We then accelerate the ions with very high voltages in a vacuum. The voltages range from several thousand volts up to one million volts, and we accelerate these particles to nearly light speed, in other words, to very high energies. At these high energies, we then shoot the particles into the semiconductor material. Of course, the greater the energy, the deeper the particles go into the material. However, we can adjust this very nicely with a lot of effort. What we can also adjust very nicely is the amount, the number of particles we implant, the dose. The sick ion implanter has its own separated area. Here we are at our sick ion implanter. This is nothing more than a particle accelerator. Since we're working with voltages that are a thousand times higher than those that come out of our power outlets at home, we have to take certain safety measures. The white doors are only an external protection, but why all the fuss? The semiconductor conducts the electric current very slowly at first. With ion implantation, we can specifically introduce foreign substances, so-called dopants, into the semiconductor material. We call this implantation, and it changes the electrical conductivity of the semiconductor drastically. This is the basic prerequisite for ultimately being able to produce electronic components, such as transistors or similar things, on a semiconductor wafer. The implanter essentially consists of two parts, source and process chamber. In the machine we have an ion source, 
ions are positively charged atoms. They are accelerated, guided around the corner here, come to the front of the process chamber where they are guided onto the wafer. Here we see the process chamber of our particle accelerator in which the wafers with our dopants are implanted. To ensure that the ions are free passage when they are accelerated, we use various vacuum pumps to create a high vacuum. High vacuum. That means around 26,000 particles per cubic centimetre. Sounds like dense air, but it is almost as empty as outer space. There's a lot of know-how and effort behind it to make sure that the machine does exactly what we want it to do, namely to shoot the right dopant with the right energy in the right amount into the material. The system technicians have to put a lot of effort into keeping the machine running. Ultimately, they also have to create this high vacuum so that the ions can fly freely and are not disturbed by any air molecules. A lot of effort goes into that too. For everything to run smoothly in the semiconductor factory, the different departments have to be coordinated, knows commercial plant manager Dirk Kress. We at Bosch manufacture sensors that make things talk, that make things record data, and that ensure the connection within the Internet of Things. We manufacture around the clock. 24-7, so to speak, it's a continuous manufacturing program. The site is open 362 days. We always like to say 24 times 7. We schedule all of these 21 shifts a week completely. In other words, if the gears don't engage properly here, we have a backlog that can hardly be cleared again. So it's very important that all departments, groups and teams work well together and really interlock like a gear wheel system. And then that has to work for 362 days. Teamwork is our core competence. Our slogan here at this location is We at RTP1. This stands for cooperation between our front-end processes, wafer production and our test centre at the back end. At the moment, this is symbolised by the bridge we're standing on. We employ all sorts of apprentices here and of course also academics. The site has been providing training here since 1965, almost since the takeover of the site by Bosch. Of course, a lot has changed over the years. New occupations have been added, new training content. The world is changing around Bosch. Bosch is changing itself. Employees play a very important role when it comes to quality. The staff follow the highest standards in order to produce high quality products every day. Quality is a very important core point. Of course, it is very important that we produce quality, but we also have 100% test coverage to ensure quality. The enormous effort that is put into the production of the several million MEMS microelectromechanical sensors every day is considered in their various test cycles, which are a science in themselves. Only the dress code is a little more casual. We have a clean room here too, but the wafers are already fully processed at this point. That means that the clean room standard in this area is no longer as critical as before. Therefore, the covering is not as extreme here either. We only wear face masks, hoods and gloves combined with a clean room gown. At the end of the process chain of two to three weeks or two to three months, a final electrical test takes place. That's the equivalent of my final building inspection or acceptance, so to speak. Only when that has been passed and every single chip is judged to be in order, can I then hand over the keys, just like when you build a new house. So that the final building acceptance can take place, about half the employees alone are on duty in the test centre. 
The wafers produced in the wafer fab are delivered here and are measured and tested for function. This means that every wafer produced in the wafer fab has to undergo a quality test. The chips on the wafer are tested 100%. When the wafers are delivered, they are sealed in the wafer box. The operator or employee who works here is not allowed to touch the wafers. We only have carriers or boxes that we transport, which we load into machines. We are not allowed to touch the wafers at all. During measuring, the chips are contacted with such measuring needles. The measuring needle is about the size of a human hair with a diameter of 75 micrometers. After loading, the additional hardware must be inserted into the machine to ensure that the correct contact unit for the particular type is installed. The machine uses a camera system to focus on the needle tips and then knows where the needle tips are and positions the wafer directly under the needle tip so it will hit the pad. Due to the variety of products we're testing here, a wafer or map has different numbers of chips on the wafer. Depending on the function, the chip is larger or smaller. It means that we have a few hundred chips to several thousand chips on one wafer, which we have to contact because we're doing a 100% test. On the electronic wafer map, the employee can see which chip has been measured and which one still has to be measured. You can also see which measured chips were good and which were conspicuous. The conspicuous chips are not processed any further. When the wafer measurement is finished, when the complete wafer has been measured, the data is sent to our system, stored and is sent to the next quality gate where the visual inspection of the chips takes place. The electromagnetic measurement is only the first part of the control stage. Just as there are possible errors that can be measured but not seen, there are also possible errors that get through the measurement but are detectable and therefore avoidable. Visual inspection is the domain of process engineer Heiko Schaefer. It is his responsibility to make sure the visual inspection finds any final defects that may have sneaked through. Fortunately, however, not with the naked eye. Only a special camera can do this. For this task, he and his team also have highly automated equipment at their disposal. We're here at the visual inspection, where we visually inspect all wafers and all chips 100% to find any anomalies that are still on the wafer. What does visual inspection mean exactly? We look at the chips which were found to be positive during measurement to make sure there are no more anomalies. The chip can then be delivered in top quality. Here you can see how the camera runs over the wafer chip by chip and scans it and immediately carries out an evaluation of whether the chip is still good. An anomaly can be something like a conductor path, which is perhaps not completely distinctive, but enough for an electrical measurement. This can lead to problems in the lifetime of the chip. Such irregularities are found here, and they result in these chips not being released for delivery. We have systems that perform the visual inspection automatically and are trained by us. This enables us to carry out an image-to-image -image comparison with a very good and optimally trained reference image so that the quality is high throughout the entire product line. Yet another technology is used. Our group has set itself the goal of producing or equipping all our products with artificial intelligence in the next decade. I always explain this to myself by saying that it's the reproduction of intelligent action by algorithms. And that's what we're doing here. We have products that contain artificial intelligence. 
but we also have products that are produced with artificial intelligence itself. I'm using an algorithm to teach a system to get better. Normally, I have a good part and a bad part compared to the visual inspections and my program compares the good part with the bad part. However, I can also teach the program to learn what a good part is. That means I can make programs learn, something which will then have uses in autonomous driving, for example. Used here in our production, this means that we make processes that are monotonous, that are prone to errors, using individual systems that simply improve themselves, for instance, in planning or in optical controls. Zum Beispiel in optischen Kontrollen. Imagine that you have to search for and evaluate anomalies in images for eight hours a day. At some point, this becomes very monotonous. That's why we want to relieve the employees by using artificial intelligence. Humans must train artificial intelligence in this area. That means we have to know about the complex algorithms we use there, we have to provide these sample images and evaluate them to ensure the algorithms have their correct function at the end. Depending on the application, the chips on the wafers are finally built and successfully tested after weeks or even months. Then there's nothing to do but wait. The finished batches finally end up in the so-called dye bank. Here they are stored under special conditions and wait to be used as sensory organs or as the brain of a device. Engineer Matthias Pauli is the man in charge of dye bank. The RTPI-1 dye bank is our strategic warehouse for finished and pre-measured wafers. Dye bank comes from English and means nothing other than wafer storage. And what exactly characterizes a strategic warehouse? Strategic warehouse means that if the customer places an order with us today and has a desired date in six weeks, then we would have no chance of meeting that date if we started to manufacture the wafers today. Our goal is to have the wafers fully processed and pre-measured in stock so that we can ship the wafers to the next two stations, assembly and final test, on the same day and meet the customer's desired date. The wafers are not touched by human hands until they're removed from storage. Roughly speaking, we have 6,000 batches stored here, all of which are logged systematically. This means that you don't have to search here. You can find out directly via the system where the goods are located that are needed and then go straight to them and take them out of storage. How much time the wafers, with all kinds of chip kits, actually spend here varies greatly. Usually the storage period is two weeks. However, we also have special cases, such as final stockpiling of parts that are no longer produced today. They are also stored here and we can store them for up to 10 years under these nitrogen conditions. If it goes beyond the 10 years, special requalification tests must be carried out. If they are successful, we can also outsource wafers that have been stored for more than 10 years. We don't store the wafers in normal air, but also in nitrogen, in clean rooms, class 1000. That's because the wafer surfaces are still freely accessible and are very sensitive to corrosion or even damage. And this nitrogen rinsing makes sure that the wafer surface remains unchanged. In order to save nitrogen, a major issue here, we have installed a special control system. If a certain humidity value is exceeded, the nitrogen control is triggered and blows out the humid air. A major issue is not only the desire to save nitrogen, but also the safety of the employees. After all, nitrogen is only harmless in the air if it doesn't exceed a certain proportion. The level of oxygen content is monitored constantly. If it were to drop below a certain level, an alarm would be triggered here, which would first be processed by the supervisors. A dangerous situation would immediately trigger an evacuation alarm. 
Fortunately, this has never happened before, except for practice purposes. More than 4 million of these end products leave our plant every day, all of which were manufactured and tested here in Reutlingen. The traditional German company is optimistic about the future. A great deal of know-how and effort will therefore continue to be invested in these tiny but smart building blocks of our everyday technological life. The RTP1 in Reutlingen, a true mega plant in a class of its own. Industry 4.0 In 1930, Henry Ford himself decided to build his next factory here. Today, the Ford plant in the Neal district of northern Cologne is one of the largest car production facilities in Europe. We have 134 assembly stations, but if only one assembly station stops, nothing will be built on the body shell afterwards. There will be no paint and no final assembly. The plant is a city in itself, but everything runs together smoothly. Two parts per minute, according to the daily working time, results in a total number of parts which currently make up 1,150 cars per day. This hall is actually the size of 18 football fields. This shows how big we actually are here. 11 awards, 11 Engines of the Year awards, no automobile manufacturer has ever achieved this before. The world is changing very fast. If we don't change now, in six months we won't be able to keep up. Today the factory is the only one for the Fiesta in Europe. Since 1979 around 9 million of these popular small cars have been produced here to be shipped all over the world. The journey from the raw material to the car begins at the goods receiving department in the pressing plant. This is where the steel is delivered from which the small cars are made. Employee Michael Riedel gets ready to unload the 30 ton steel coil. For this, heavy lifting equipment is used. In working slang of the plant, these rolls are called coils. Michel couldn't unload the coil by hand anyway. However, even in the further course of production, hardly any employees need to touch the individual parts, which turn into over 1,100 cars a day in the Ford plant in Cologne. No touch is the name of the concept to increase efficiency and quality. It starts with the receipt of goods. About 1,000 quarter panels or 3,000 hoods are pressed out of it. On the computer, I take the call. That means that the interim storage is called by me whenever it's needed. It is needed very quickly. The massive steel presses consume up to five kilometers of flat rolled steel, or 10 coils per day. The gigantic pressing plant, which could comfortably accommodate several jumbo jets, leaves the visitor amazed. This is not only due to the enormous dimensions of around 200 by 250 meters, but also to the facts and figures. Press plant manager Klaus Pobanz knows them all by heart. In total, we have 11 pressing plant lines with a tonnage of between 400 and 3,600 tonnes. The presses in the Cologne pressing plant supply Ford plants throughout Europe. In total, 130,000 tonnes of steel are processed here every year. This is a huge amount, and it makes about 28 million parts. The 28 million parts are largely used in the Fiesta, which is produced here in Cologne. They also go to other plants such as Cryovar in Romania, Valencia in Spain or Zalui. Around 16,000 employees work at the Ford facility in Cologne, but only a few of them in the pressing plant. We have a three-shift scenario. That means we run three shifts a day, 15 shifts a week. 
We have 450 employees, not only from the pressing plant, but also from the logistics department. We've got a tool shop and a machine park as well. The tools are the huge blocks that are used to press the steel into the various part shapes. Here we're in press tool maintenance. We look after about 158 tool sets. Tool sounds small, but it's a little different here. The tool change time here is 15 minutes, which is actually considered quite good in European or worldwide operations. After that, robot programs are installed, new controls are installed for tool sets, the grippers are changed, and a test run is performed. A tryout is performed to see if the first parts are OK. That the parts are processed efficiently, with the well-being of the employees in mind, is ensured by Zara Gielen. The manager is convinced by the advantages of the no-touch concept. This no-touch concept ensures that a part is automatically stacked in a standard rack. It can also be automatically entered or loaded and unloaded in our system in the body shop. This is a huge advantage in efficiency. Anyone who produces as many steel parts as a car factory has to think about how best to move heavy parts from one plant to another flexibly, fast and safely. One of the biggest challenges for the car manufacturer and the real strength of this mega factory lies in the smart design of its logistics. How that is put into practice in Cologne is demonstrated by production engineer Ibrahim Chifti. Here is a packaging that we've specially developed for our patented process. The packaging is loaded with our camera and robot-based technology. This principle is patented and was developed by us. The patent is a gift to the company. It enables us to increase the quality and production efficiency in the factory. What's special about the packaging is that we normally have simple pallet cages where the parts are placed inside at random. With this packaging, the parts are placed inside in a particular order and available at any time in the factory and can be used optimally in the further processes. We've been able to introduce additional quality controls although the parts are dispatched to the packaging automatically. The efficiency has increased because we get more parts into this packaging and the quality has also increased because the robots always put the parts into the packaging in the same constellation. This means there's no loss of quality during packaging or removal. In the pressing plant, packaging refers to the transport systems that bring the parts from one place to another. Right next door, the packaging is prepared with laser assistance. The laser up there shows green dots on the wheel, and according to the markings, the employee puts rods in or takes rods out again if there's too many. That was the first step we took to start this system. In the further course of the project, we're planning to build a system that relieves people of the hard work. Optimization is carried out wherever possible at the Ford plant in Cologne. What is created here is often taken up by the entire group. The no-touch concept which we have put into operation here and developed ourselves is now the basis for all plants worldwide. It has now been implemented because it's a huge benefit. However, we invented it here in Cologne. And, of course, we now supply all the data to our colleagues within the Ford world, because it is important that we continue to work as efficiently as possible. How the no-touch concept can be implemented successfully is shown in the next production stage. Uwe Weins is head of body shell manufacturing and is responsible for turning the parts supplied to him into car bodies. He's the master of more than 1,000 industrial robots, which also relieve people of the light parts.
We're standing at the beginning of the manufacturing process for the rear floor subassembly. Here we see a system that enables us to automatically grip bulk goods with robots without the need for employees to pick up the parts, put them to one side or transport them further. At this point, we choose a robot because the part is very well suited to being taken out of the box by a robot. This way, we relieve people of unergonomic monotonous work which is then taken over by the machine and at the same time, we increase the overall efficiency when feeding the parts into the automation process. We use blue light to protect the camera from external light influences. Extraneous light would cause problems for the camera identifying the parts. This would lead to mistakes and losses in the production chain. A body shell is highly automated. We have 1,200 robots in our body shop and the creativity we have here in Cologne to invent things ourselves is high. We make sure that this can be done as efficiently as possible and this experience is not only used in the body shop but also in the pressing plant. The pressing plant may use the experience gained in the body shop but what is not used here is hidden beneath the surface. Here you can see a whole range of monitors. On the monitors you can see what's going on in the basement. There are different conveyor belts because each press line contains a conveyor belt. All of the waste that is collected here goes up into a wagon. We have about 40,000 tons of scrap or offcuts a year. And that scrap goes back to the steel maker to produce new steel. Beneath the hall is a hidden tunnel system in which conveyor belts run for kilometers. You have to imagine that we have a total area of about 50,000 square meters above and below the pressing plant. Down here are all the hydraulics, all the scrap belts. In terms of the belts, we have a length of just under two and a half kilometers located below the press line alone. They transport all the scrap to the wagons, which then go back to the steel producers. This way, the waste parts might soon get a second chance to become a fender after all. Since 2008, we've been using green electricity on the entire site, saving 160,000 tons of CO2 per year. We have special working groups which together always consider the costs because, of course, the world is changing and the techniques are new. We're also increasing automation and every time we put our automation into operation, we think about where the electricity comes from and what we have to do here on site to keep our costs as low as possible. Keeping costs as low as possible is the goal of almost all companies. Industrial companies therefore try to automate their processes as much as possible. This is where the AGVS helps. AGVS means Automatic Guided Vehicle System, so no person needs to control the system. It works like this. We have two subgroups, right side and left side. In each subgroup a part is produced and the driverless transport system brings these parts from the subgroup to the main production line. In everyday work life, the machines find their way around by themselves. As I said, the vehicles drive fully automatically, and they also load fully automatically, but they only drive and load automatically if the current condition of our facility allows it. They have to finish one job first, and only then they can start the new one. Employees don't need to be afraid of the AGVS. They have all the safety features and scanners that recognize us as people and stop for us. At first, the employees were very skeptical. 
Depending on how often they were in contact with the vehicles, it took about three to six months for them to get used to the vehicle and its functions. Just like the AGVS, body shop boss Uwe Vines continues to make his rounds. Here we are at the so-called clamp belt, which is one of the core pieces in body shell manufacturing. And this is the first time we see the body shell actually taking shape. The frame was equipped with an RFID chip shortly before. Since the RFID on the vehicle carries all product information, the system knows which vehicle is to be built next by reading it out. Three-door or five-door vehicle. The robots are then controlled accordingly and pick up the sidewalls. This means that the three-door part is added to the three-door floor, the five-door part to the five-door floor. The machine knows this completely automatically and this process is carried out for the entire body shell construction. It's used in the paintwork and the final assembly as well, until the car arrives at the dealers, who then removes this tag during the first inspection. Where chips set the pace and driverless transport systems whiz across the corridors, a so-called cobot is not far away. This refers to a robot that works with humans. The special thing about what we see before us is the interaction between man and machine. The employee is protected by sensitive sensors built into the robot. And here, for the first time, we have the possibility for a robot to carry out its tasks unprotected, without offence, and in a very confined space together with the employee. His colleagues get along well with the robot. His name is Uncle Manfred. Uncle Manfred does the gluing. I actually work with him. When I do my job, he does my prep work. And it fits. We meet right in the middle. That's a good thing. I don't get covered in glue. I'm clean, and that's worth a lot. No glue on my gloves, and that's a good thing. However, Uncle Manfred is the exception. The vast majority of industrial robots are gruff powerhouses from which their human colleagues have to be protected by blue fences. Nobody should get in their way. Their rapid and monotonous movements do not take careless employees into account. Their fascinating moves are best observed from a safe distance. In the meantime, Uwe has reached the soldering section. Here, the roof and side walls are inseparably joined together. The lasers are so powerful that they are too dangerous for human eyes and must be concealed in a protective chamber. The automatic conveyor system conveys up to 50 car bodies per hour along the line to the soldering cabin, which resembles a garage. We're standing at the end of the so-called laser soldering line. In this stage, we join the roof to the pre-welded body. The special thing about this is that we don't use spot-welded joints, but a laser soldering technique. This means that a laser supplies the energy and a soldering wire is fed in. This is how the connection between the roof and the side walls are made. In the cell, the roof is soldered to the side wall. So, why laser? Laser technology is very precise and has a very high process speed. With laser soldering, thin, smooth seams are achieved, which you can see on the car afterwards. The complex part is that our devices have to generate a so-called zero gap. This means that the gap between the roof and the sidewall must be close to zero to within a tenth of a millimeter. The big advantage of laser soldering is that the overall structure of the body can be kept much stiffer than with regular spot welding. This laser seam line is extremely sensitive to any deviation and must be joined with high precision. 
There's a camera incorporated in the laser head. It makes a high-speed recording of the laser soldering process. Our set parameters are at 3,000 watts on a few square millimeters. It's like concentrating the full energy of 50 domestic light bulbs on one point. The varnishing will show if they last. After soldering, the engine hoods and other moving parts are attached to the now fixed frame. The body can soon be varnished. At the end of the hall, where the pressing plant and body shell production are located, things become very calm and focused. Random samples are taken in the measuring laboratory to check whether the components meet exact specifications. Deviations are only accepted in the micrometer range. Engineer Georg Zieslik can rely on several systems for this. The futuristic looking eagle eye system and contact measurement. We have different measuring methods here. One is optical measurement and the other is tactile measurement. Optical measurement is contactless, i.e. the sensor doesn't touch the part. Tactile measurement has a measuring tip that moves up to the component and scans it in order to generate data that we have in the measuring machine's coordinates system. We have a measuring program for each component, which we then work through for a target actual comparison. If the eagle eye or the tactile measuring instrument find deviations that exceed certain tolerances, the production process is examined. Even if it is faultlessly constructed, a car will not run without an engine. Conveniently, it's built right next door. Around 500 employees work in three shifts to produce the heart of the small car. Thomas Meyer is plant manager of the engine works, which is also located in Cologne. The engineer is proud of his product. This engine is especially good because it's the latest generation. It's well tuned in terms of friction. It has bearing combinations coordinated in the micrometer range, which is hardly visible on your hand. It has an adjustable oil pump, which no engine in this class has. It has a split cooling circuit inside the engine. Regular in this class is one. This one has two. What exactly happens inside the engine? At the gas station, I fill up with petrol or diesel. In this case, it's petrol. The petrol is injected into a cylinder chamber via fuel pumps and injection pumps. This gets compressed and fresh air is brought in. Then there's a fuel-air mixture which is ignited by a spark. Then there's an explosion which causes the piston to move, the crankshaft to move and the transmission to move the car. The parts come either from other Ford plants or from suppliers, although not yet ready for installation. If the engine works, almost every part is worked at before it is installed. For example, each individual crankshaft must be precisely balanced. Meyer explains why. These are balancing machines, and they're used to balance the weight of the crankshaft. The crankshaft is the heart of the engine and has to run smoothly at high or low revs. If the crankshaft doesn't run smoothly, vibrations build up and can lead to serious engine damage. A practical example. In the army, it's forbidden for many people to march in step over a bridge. The bridge can start to vibrate and the vibration can destroy the bridge. In this case, it's the same. If there's an imbalance, a harmonic vibration builds up and this can lead to serious engine damage. 
Therefore, you have to drill off certain weight proportions. This is then called balancing. But how do the machines know how much material to drill off? I know the drill diameter, the depth and the density of the material, so we know how much we have to take out to have a defined imbalance. The finely balanced crankshafts, the heart of the engine, are now ready for installation, but before the 2,000 individual parts become an engine, they pass through around 50 production steps. During this process, a data profile is created for each engine, which is used during production, but can also be useful afterwards. Each engine gets its identification number at the beginning of the line, and a lot of data is collected for this identification number. If an engine should ever leak in the field, we can look at the engine number and find out when it was built, when it went through this plant, and when the sealant was applied. However, sealing is not only important on the engine, but also on the body. The vehicle frames are now completely assembled, and the next step for them is the giant paint shop. Before they get their respective colour, the seams are thoroughly sealed. Production engineer Dennis Kuhn explains how. The sheet metal parts are manufactured and welded together in the body shop. There are small gaps between the sheet metal parts, and we seal these gaps here. This is also known as seam sealing, and we do this here. We have 20 robots distributed over two lines. The body enters the line and is measured precisely by a camera system. This data is then transmitted to the robots. The robot is then able to place the sealing material exactly over these seams or over these gaps. Altogether, we build a total of 70 units per hour on both lines. After the automatic line, we have another employee area. The employees check the seams done by the robots, finish some of them, and then lay additional seams, especially in areas which are difficult to get to, like in the door areas. Before the seams were sealed, the frames were only given a primer coat. This area is the last production step in which they are not yet assigned a specific order. Dennis has arrived at the paint line where the bodies get their paint, an area that is strictly separated from the rest of the paint shop, as the whole production section is called. Only now, on the paint line, are the car bodies given an identity. Before the paint is applied to the primer, a very soft and flexible cleaner does its work. The so-called emu rolls are supposed to remove the very last particles of dust. The name comes from the fact that the system is equipped with feathers from the emu. They have the property that they absorb dust very well. That's why these side rollers run over the surface of the car body and bind any layers of dust. Apart from the emu feathers, the system is highly computerized. First, we apply the finishing coat in the paint line with 35 robots. This is the visible coat that gives the Fiesta its coloring. We're able to apply up to 16 colors at the same time in this paint line. We have an intelligent car body control system, which specifies the colors as the bodies enter the paint line, depending on the subsequent clear coat which is then applied. The whole thing starts in the primer, because the colors build on each other. First comes the primer, which is the basic layer, and depending on the primer, the top and the clear coat is applied. A darker primer is usually applied first with a darker coat on top. The two employees can breathe in without concern, despite the nearby paint spraying facilities. Due to strong ventilation in the paint line, it is neutral in smell. 
Basically, we suck in fresh air from the outside, which is conditioned and also humidified. This air is then passed through filters in the ceiling and directed from above down into the paint line. This is known as controlling the airflow velocity, and it also helps us to ensure that excess paint particles that do not land on the car body are deflected and discharged. In Thomas Meyer's workshop, the engines are now fully assembled and ready for the black light test. That is, the examination with black light. Will they find a leak? I have a camera, I have black light, and there's oil in the engine. The engine has already been tested cold, has been rotated a few times, and then I'll have a look if there's oil leaking from the engine. The oil contains a fluorescent agent, which can be seen with the black light. On the screen, there are predefined areas of the engine where there could be leaks, component pairings that have been sealed and where oil can leak out. The peculiarity of our engine production is that we test 100% of all engines using this test. This test ensures that the engine doesn't leak and only 2.5% of our engines are tested using the hot test. That means 2.5% of our engines are started, the rest is only tested cold and then installed in the vehicles. This is a special feature for the high quality standard we have here. We do not have to test 100%. Quality inspector Thomas Biller is responsible for the samples taken from production. He carries out the hot test or the hot run, and that too begins in the dark. Every engine that is fired is again thoroughly checked for possible leaks using a UV lamp. If Thomas doesn't find anything, the hot run can begin. This is a function test bench for the engines coming off the line. Random engines are tested here. Other car manufacturers are still at 100%. We started at 5%, we're at 2.5% now. And for quality reasons, we always do spot checks. For us, it's absolutely legitimate to have 2.5%. Thomas makes final preparations. The test engine is connected. Here, the engine is fired with petrol, filled with water and connected to the electrical system. That's a hot run. A lot of experience is needed for the job. There are various things Thomas has to pay attention to. I'm examining the engine to see if there are any faults. For example, is there a leak during the test run? Does the engine make any noises, any rattling, or does it function faultlessly? He detects suspicious noises using an unexpected method. We have a very old method for this, the so-called ear trumpet. When I put it on the engine, I hear different noises. You have to be trained for this. You have to have some experience in the automotive field because the engine makes lots of different sounds. Every part sounds different, so you need experience to hear it. As soon as everything is ready, he starts the test routine, about 15 times per shift. Checks are also carried out in the paint shop. First, the car bodies pass through a dirt and paint detection machine. The machine that you can see behind me spots dirt in the finish. A light portal is moved through a frame and cameras spot anything caught in the painted surface. The lamps and the camera system, together with a sophisticated algorithm, detect these inclusions and show the faults on monitors.
The employee will then rework the defects while the process is running. Here, every flaw in the paintwork is discovered nowadays, however, mainly by cameras. In the past, the employees had to find the errors themselves. This has now been made easier for them with this system. This means they can spend more time processing the faults and less time looking for and finding them. Nevertheless, the employee still has to keep a close eye on the entire surface. The system itself stores the errors associated with the car body and outputs them line tracked with the car body on the conveyor belt. This information is also recorded and then always displayed at the exact workstation where the monitors are located. And it almost always works. Now it's on the next one already, the next car. Under the light, which clearly highlights anything that's uneven, the cameras on the ceiling detect spots that are only a few millimetres in size. We have a tolerance, blue, a small faults up to 0.3. Anything above that, the larger faults, is then marked in red. Spotlessly polished, the bodies leave the paint shop and disappear into a huge silo. Here they wait to be picked up for final assembly. A fully automated system takes care of the storage and pickup, always taking exactly the car body that is next in line, depending on the order and delivery time. Betty Chirion Otto is one of two people who coordinate the final assembly at the Ford plant in Cologne. We are responsible for safety at work, for the quality of our Ford Fiesta and, of course, for the number of units we have to produce here every day. By this I mean that we produce an unbelievable 1,150 vehicles per day via two parallel systems with a cycle time of 82 seconds. This means that we have two Fiestas coming off the assembly line here every 82 seconds. To be able to handle these quantities systematically, Betty and her team need one thing above all else – space. This hall is 18 football fields in size, and this really shows how big we are. About 326 employees per shift work on our Ford Fiesta, which has an incredible 4,300 parts. How do we as division managers actually keep track of things here? We are indeed dependent on our great employees. In addition, communication is incredibly important in this large area. How do we do that? We communicate here exclusively on mobile phones. Given the fact that we produce two Fiestas in 82 seconds, we have to act very quickly here. So in 82 seconds we can't afford a 60 second break, as that might mean we've already lost one Fiesta like this. Anyone who doesn't know their way around here can easily lose their bearings, but everything is strictly organised. We have 10 lines here, each with a foreman. A foreman has about 30 to 40 employees. A line is basically divided into four teams, which are supervised by a team coach who always has to step in when an employee needs to go to the toilet or when a quality problem arises or when there's a problem with a tool. So it is possible to act flexibly and provide support. The employees also get support from a computer, more precisely from a touch screen on which they can complete a virtual training session directly at their workplace. All the stations in the final assembly and all the required actions follow a set logic. This is clearly explained in short 3D tutorials. Here is a virtual training. You see in the video every single work that you 
Next week I'm supposed to learn a new job. Before that I was shown virtually which movements I have to do there. If I want to learn a new job and develop my skills further, I ask the foreman if that's OK. If he gives me the OK, we train this virtually first and then at the workplace. And in an emergency, it can also happen that I have to step in. Every employee can go to the touch screen to acquire the knowledge they need. It can also serve as a refresher. If we're short-handed, this might happen once a month, otherwise according to demand. If I feel ready to go on to another workplace, I can take the virtual training and learn about it. Employees already know their own work steps, but we need them to be flexible. There has to be some rotation among themselves so they can also swap jobs from time to time. Some members of our team would like to rotate after every cycle. There are others who have reached a certain age and are only doing one station and are happy with it. We react to what the employees themselves would like. Only a few steps remain until the 4,300 individual parts have become a roadworthy automobile. A great moment, chassis and body are united. In Cologne, however, there is an additional special feature. We're here at the marriage. The marriage is the joining together of the chassis and bodywork. Basically, this is where the heart is put into our Fiesta, and this is what every car manufacturer calls it. The special thing about our marriage, in contrast to all our competitors, is that our marriage is fully automated. No employee has to take responsibility for the precision of this combination between body and chassis. The automation continues to the end. Now the front, back and rear windows are fitted to the small car. The different possible configurations are managed by the systems independently. Representative for all our systems, these line here use so-called scanners which scan the label on the roof of our car bodies. Basically, they pass the information onto our systems, which then know exactly what type of vehicle it is. They know exactly what to do, which type of glass to pick up, whether light or dark, with chrome or without chrome. And especially with regard to our three-door or five-door models, it is relevant to know how many windows are to be installed in the bodywork. Equipped with the right set of windows and married to the chassis, the car is now fitted with the wheels. Then it's completed. Since the coil was delivered to the press shop, it has taken 12 hours to get the Ford standing on its own axles for the first time. But finished? Not quite. In the very last step of our entire production, so-called ECATS devices are placed on the steering wheels and connected to the vehicles. These devices are used to configure or program functions within the vehicle. These are things like the radio settings, for example, or the radio itself. The touch screen inside the car must be configured and programmed according to customer requirements and wishes. This includes the interior lighting, which goes on or off in certain modes. All this is configured and programmed using these ECATS devices. However, there is also one thing that is indispensable in final assembly. An employee has to physically perform various actions. He has to operate the clutch, the brake or switch the lights on and off. The device as such cannot do this. Now the Fiesta can literally roll off the proverbial assembly line as one of 1,150 in Cologne every day. Round the next corner, the customers, or rather their critical eye, is already waiting. We are here at the final inspection, the CAL, or Customer Acceptance Line as it's called. 
We look at the car from a customer's perspective. In each shift, we look at about 600 cars. We inspect the entire outer skin of the vehicle, move around the vehicle to check for faults, dirt inclusions, dents and bumps. The second step is the interior inspection, where the doors are opened and all interior panels are checked. I'm always happy when we check a car and it's turned out well, because then the customer's happy, and we all benefit from it. That's why I drive a Fiesta myself. In 1932, the first vehicle rolled off the production line in Neil. At that time, the capacity was still 60 cars per day. Since then, the output in the Cologne mega plant has increased 20-fold.